Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the last talk of today Warsaw JS meeting. I'm gonna continue with uh, my enterprise interface architecture talks. Back in June, I was talking about JSON schema and the topic for today is seeking scalable design. My name is Tomek Ducin. I work in Cybercom Poland as interface architect and developer. Apart from that, I do some presentations, uh, workshops, trainings, and I organize conferences a little bit. And um, today I want to share my experience of uh, working for uh, banking industry. I was working uh, in two banking pr uh, project uh, interfaces so far. The first one was for, for a big Polish bank and the application was uh, written in Backbone and Marionette.js and I was working as a contractor. And the current project I'm working for is uh, for a big um, group of Scandinavian banks and we were and we were working in uh, Angular JS and I'm uh, a, let's say a core uh, developer and designer in this project and uh, I want to share my experience about this with you so uh, let's take a look at this uh, this is uh, seeking in front of the scalable design uh, the thing is that the industry is still adapting the single page applications into big enterprise apps and this is not an easy process. Like uh, most of the banks are still generating the front end on the server side, so they use uh, technologies just like uh, Java server pages or ASP.NET or whatever other technology you use. And there are some that try to use uh, SPA and they have their ups and downs and most of them have their downs. <laughs> so um, it's, it's not easy to find an example to follow. And that's why we're all seeking the scalable design. We're still looking for it, trying to find the best patterns that just achieve the goals. So I would like to start with uh, briefly describing what is a business environment of an enterprise project. Um, what is the situation, what you may uh, expect, what problems you may face, and how, just, how does it feel to work in such project? Then we will uh, talk about um, the architecture, the layers and components in terms both of an interface of a bank and just generally of a bank infrastructure. Uh, and finally, um, we will talk about some of the solutions, possible solutions, that might ease working for banks. So, um, the first question is, can you see what these people are doing here in this picture? Yeah, go on. Yeah, they're painting the grass to a green color. Everybody who is Polish should understand uh, what, what does it mean for non-Polish speakers. This is making good impression when like, providing absolutely no, uh, no value at all. And this is um, what uh, working in bank is uh, really about. And this is what all people do. And um, yeah, just kidding. But um, well, it's, it's, um, it's completely different when you uh, take a look uh, if you look at uh, banking, uh, working in a bank from developer point of view and from a manager point of view, this is a completely different world. Anyway, um, what you can, what problems you may face is uh, budget-driven development. So you can forget about Agile, about Kanban, um, about Scrum, about sometimes you can even forget about Waterfall. And there is like every man for himself uh, methodology. So um, you need to um, like be ready for that. Uh, another thing is that, um, as you may expect, uh, banking solutions are big, are complex, and there are quite many people working on this. These people change. These people work in different locations. So usually um, there is a core team that works on the core components, and there are contractors that are like um, hired to do a certain job, and then they can be replaced or the cooperation might continue. It depends on the business things. Anyway, um, 
you might, as a core developer, you might work with uh, some contractors uh, in the same office. They might uh, work in a different office in the same town. They might work in a different town, different country, or even different continent. And as a result, they may work in a different time zone, different culture. So this is quite difficult to, um, to include all those technical and like human-related things to make a um, good cooperation, a fruitful cooperation. And um, also, uh, when, when we will see the layers of a banking system later, uh, different teams working in different cultures and different time zones work on different components which need to communicate to each other. So this is also something that you need to be aware of and need to cope with somehow. And uh, another thing is that when you want to build an application, let's say that you're a new uh, employee and you want to uh, fetch the project, deploy it on your local host, uh, Fetching the project is not, doesn't have to be uh, just like Git clone and you've got all the code here and you can just run a script. It might be a whole procedure that might take some approvals. Um, so it might take like a few days until you can finally run the application. And when you do have it, it may take like uh, running the start server script. It may take like one hour or it may take even longer. It depends on many factors. So um, you need to be... Um, you know, um, waiting, <laughs> waiting is something you, you do quite often in this job. And um, the system is big. Like, um, you have lots of different modules. And the biggest threat is that there is a lot of copy-paste because there is a, a key difference between core developers and the contractors. The core developer needs to work on the quality. He needs to make the system as um, concise, as rigid, and uh, um, stable, and, and so on. And the contractor, uh, usually, uh, is his, uh, his main aim is to deliver the project uh, and not to cross the deadline, and if it's possible, to make it even faster, just to be able to work on another project for his company. So these are totally different aims. And if the contractor is not really um, experienced, this might uh, result in lots of copy-paste code. So probably when you enter a bank, this is what you will see. For example, you might see some uh, jQuery forms, uh, jQuery handled forms that will have like 800 lines of code and the difference would be in just two lines because that was faster for somebody. So yeah, this is, this is just what happens. And finally, um, the thing that might happen is that backends uh, become unavailable and you need to cope with that somehow. And um, like going uh, forward with this point, uh, I'm going to tell you a short story about front-end and back-end. So imagine there is a team of front-end developers and team of back-end developers. And an old-fashioned design is that front-end will be tightly coupled with back-end. Um, what I mean is that front-end can't exist without a back-end. So uh, an API, let's say, needs to, uh, needs to be stable and needs to respond with the, with the uh, requests uh, immediately. If it doesn't, or if the API is down, the front-end is just useless. There is no front-end. So, um, what happens quite often is that uh, the backend might fall into some troubles. It may just uh, fall down, and it becomes unavailable. And um, it can be, like, it's not very often that it happens in production environment, because this is a really big uh, problem <laughs> for the institution. But you can always have uh, failures of development environment and test environment. And this is, uh, these are the environments we work in, like, all the time. So if these uh, backends are down, then, then this affects our work. So when a um, backend failure happens, then the backend developers need to wear hats and turn it into firefighter team. So they need to start working on fixing the issue as fast as possible. And it can take like one hour, it can take one day, or it can take even longer. And in the meantime, front-end developers don't uh, have an API to talk to, so they try to find another like activities they might do. And this time, this might be like coffee, uh, table football or just reading uh, tutorials from the web. 
And um, in fact, they don't feel really bad about it. <laughs> and um, the problem is that it is a big cost for the company because if you have like a 10 developer front-end team and they don't do anything for two or three days, this is a big cost. And it doesn't matter whether you're a contractor or core developer. So this is something that happens. And uh, concerning the backend team, um, usually, uh, usually you will have a lot more backend developers in uh, big enterprise systems than frontend developers. And um, actually, what might happen is that they will make fun of JavaScript a lot. And uh, like this is uh, something similar to an uh, image that uh, a drawing that my teammates did on a whiteboard with a marker, and they call it JavaScript. <laughs> so um, they make fun of JavaScript a lot all the time, and uh, well, they stopped their education on front end like about 2005, when you could just use jQuery to do colorful forms and animations, and that was all. And they didn't realize that there was like no JS introduced or other goodies that we that we um, do use all the time. They just don't know about it, so they um, they don't mostly like I don't mean that it's about all the people, but mostly they don't know JavaScript and they don't really understand it. And they make fun of it and um, you're in the minority, so you have to cope with this somehow. And um, yeah, <laughs> this is something you just have to deal with somehow. Okay, so this is mainly like the business environment of working in uh, enterprise uh, environment. And now let's talk about architecture a little bit. Um, I'll just briefly uh, like, uh, draw um, what is the main um, architecture of all uh, banking, uh, let's say, system. And then we will focus on the in, uh, interface. So as you can see here, this is, um, this is just a three-layer uh, diagram. This is how most banks are um, built. So, at the bottom, you've got the core system. This is where uh, real operations are being done. So this is where the data is stored, or it might be stored somewhere beneath. But this is where you do all the operations on, uh, on money. This is where you uh, keep the data and do all this uh, critical financial banking stuff. And this is uh, COBOL or PL1, Programming Language 1, and all the uh, technologies that have been around since 1960s. And when uh, IT industry didn't have good design patterns yet, or the people didn't uh, like, were not eager to use those design patterns. Um, yes, and um, another uh, layer is the server side. Um, we can call it API. And this is either Java or .NET or other um, technologies, enterprise technologies. And what they do is to provide security, is to provide transactions, is to provide scalability so that uh, access to these operations is distributed into, like, say, 100 uh, nodes or 200 nodes or just 1,000 of nodes. So this is where all those enterprise things like uh, EJB or Spring comes in. And finally, um, we've got the client side. And um, the old-fashioned um, design was that server-side and client-side were actually bound together because the front-end was generated by server-side. But we will be discussing uh, the uh, separated uh, design so that we've got a single-page application that talks uh, through a REST uh, to a RESTful API over um, HTTP. And the server-side talks uh, to the core either by protocols like SOAP or some custom binary protocols. So um, how do you think? Which layer is the most troublesome layer of all of those? Server side. Server side. Any other ideas? Client. Excuse me? Client side. Client side. Do you really think so? Core. core. Yes. Yes, core is the most troublesome uh, layer of this. You know, um, the problem is that the most failures happen really uh, here, and um, like um, you can have uh, difficult communication to to this layer because uh, let's say 
Uh, one of the platforms of COBOL uh, had a limitation that you can't have programs that will have more than seven characters, like in its length. So if you wanted to have like 500 operations and you're, you had limited length of an operation, then you could uh, have a command that was called like AX71ZGH. Uh, and this is your operation you need to deal with. And you've got like 500 of operations like this. And, and uh, their attributes are the same. So um, this is how it looks like. And um, all this has been done since, yeah, since 1960s. And there is uh, great deals of codes. It's great amounts. And it's so big that nobody is going to rewrite it. Never, because it would be too costful. And that's why there is this middle layer which tries to take care of it, more or less. So the most uh, difficult part is, is that one, especially that um, enterprise layer is, uh, is younger. Like it's, it's like since, I don't know, uh, 1980s or 1990s, but it's a lot younger than this one. So uh, just younger people do work in this, uh, comparing to that one. So you can talk to them easier. <laughs> and this is also uh, quite important. Yeah, and the problems that, um, that are here might be like distributed upwards. So this is another thing. And um, yeah, briefly about the client side. This is an, a diagram that I try to um, explain how I see how, um, how modern client side in enterprise system uh, could look like. So the, um, the easiest component is just the third party lips. <laughs> it doesn't have to be explained anyway. So this is where you, where you get uh, Ember 1 or Ember 2 or just underscore, backbone, angular or whatever other tools you use. And um, this is the application core. As you might imagine, this is uh, the reusable uh, mechanisms, the most generic ones that are used throughout the whole system. Um, <coughs> widgets and components is something that is strictly uh, connected to the application core. Like widgets and components could be like a, um, a checkbox uh, that has AJAX support built in, or uh, this could be an Angular directive, for example, that you configure, uh, that you have a specific behavior, and that you will use such component in 200 places or 2,000 places, and it will work the same way, and it will be tested, it will be generic, and it will be documented, and you will not have that many of those components. And if you need to um, provide like a new feature for such component, it will be available throughout the whole system. So this is, this is the la layer. And finally, the business modules layer, which is the specific views, specific forms. So for example, if you're a um, contractor to a uh, banking project, then you will have a specification to do a module which will have like 10 pages with forms and some steps, business processes and so on. And you just use everything that is beneath you don't edit this stuff. You just use the architecture, the infrastructure that has been given to you, provided, and you just parameterize this. Um, if you have a really advanced solution, you can do this using uh, templates and the JSON files only. And the system will automatically take everything into account and make it work. This is, this is possible. And going back to the teams, like we've got the core developer teams and the contractors. Usually the core developer teams is a small team of some, you know, hardcore uh, people that are, um, that are like, uh, have done the, those things before. And uh, this uh, contractor is, um, yeah, is like business um, related things that you need to uh, just uh, make a module very fast and to just uh, get some money for this. So sometimes you just don't get JavaScript people into such projects. So you need to be aware that um, those developers might make each, uh, like every mistake that you will allow them to make. So um, the good thing to do is to think about all the problems they will make. They might not understand promises, that might not understand scopes of JavaScript, and so on and so on. So, uh, yeah, need to take care of it when designing these things. So, um, like, those two layers should be defined by people who are 
who like have a deep understanding of JavaScript to encapsulate them and to make them reusable and to try to uh, disallow making any kind of mistakes, for example, by um, encapsulating those uh, components, for example, to be used only with JSON files, because um, this can be automated to check the uh, content of a JSON file, and it would just work automatically. And this is just uh, for the contractors. So um, I would like to show you an example of a business module, um, an example project that you might do in a, business, uh, in a banking project. So let's say that we've got a page that we have transfers. It's a list of transfers with a new transfer button. And we want to uh, make a new transfer. So we click this button. Then we have the um, loading icon, this, uh, like, the view is being reloaded. Then we get a modal pop-up, and um, the form appears. Um, we submit the data into it. We uh, click go on, go to the next step. Then the interface reloads the step. The second step appears. Then we've got uh, the information that we have uh, uh, entered. And this is what uh, the API understands, and it asks us uh, whether it's okay and whether we want to submit it. So we click Submit. Then the page reloads again. Then we get another page, and it says Success. Of course, that could be um, some kind of authorization by an SMS or whatever, but yeah, it doesn't matter here. And uh, the Success informs the user that the uh, operation um, finished uh, successfully. Then we click OK. Then we have another, um, like, Reloading. Finally, uh, the model uh, window is uh, closed, but um, the transfer table is not up to date, so we need to update it. So there is another loading thing, and uh, we load the new um, content for this thing. So this is just an example module, a very simple module, because it uh, contains of three steps that are done sequentially, like one after another. And what you might find is like seven or six like uh, steps, and they do uh, split into alternative paths. They might end in different places. They might go back into some, yeah, this is just a, a directed graph, so it might be a lot more complex. And um, yeah, there might be like forms that um, when you make a selection in a, in a checkbox, uh, not a checkbox, in a uh, dropdown, then another things would be loaded basing on the value selected. So yeah, this might be um, more uh, complex than this. So when, you, when we think about the challenges of enterprise front end, what it really is, um, yeah, so there is lots of uh, new stuff that we are talking about, like web sockets and visualizations, web workers, multimedia, and lots of other things connected with HTML5. This is not what you're going to do in such a system. Um, like, I don't find it <laughs> that bad, because the thing that you deal with all the time is asynchronicity. So you need to have a really deep understanding of what is Ajax, what is a promise, and what is a deferred, like, Learn promises and deferreds need nothing more to work in a bank. And um, it's not only about um, understanding what is resolved, what is reject, what is then, and so on, but it's like uh, about combining the promises. It's about combining the promises and nesting them into like bigger, bigger structures. And we will see this just in a while. So um, the demo I have made, uh, for the demo I have, made, I have shown you before, this is a um, simplified diagram of promises and deferreds, and mainly the control flow of this uh, entire uh, application. So here, the, uh, the lowest part, the black arrow, is the main level. Let's say that this is the thread of, um, of a tab in a browser. So this is just the thread of JavaScript that just might do nothing. So when we click the um, new transfer button, then the transfer process begins. And this is going to be a, um, this is our custom thing. This is not something uh, related like with uh, built-in promises like Ajax or, or like uh, set timeout or nothing like this. This is our custom deferred object that we will manually uh, resolve or reject. And when the transfer process uh, begins, then we would like to, in this case, we would like to open a modal window 
And as we know, for example, if we use uh, Twitter Bootstrap, uh, when we use a model, we get a uh, promise that will be either resolved or rejected whether um, this um, promise has been, uh, like w whether this uh, window has been uh, um, closed with an OK or a cancel button. So, uh, but it doesn't have to be a model. So, um, in this model, we will have the steps uh, made sequentially. This is all, again, a simplification. And um, yeah, when, when the steps are done, when the last step is done and the application needs to be aware of it, then we can uh, close the model window. And when the model window is closed, when this uh, promise is resolved, either resolved or rejected, then we may either resolve or reject the transfer process. And basing on this, the main level will react to this. So this is mainly uh, what you will be doing in a um, banking system. And each system, uh, each step, sorry, um, is not just a step as you might imagine. Uh, you might need to, depending on the tools you use, you might need to load the view and you might need to call an AJAX request to get the values that are uh, required for the first step. Like if you want to show a form that will have a drop down with some values, then you need to run an AJAX. Then we are waiting for the user interaction in the meantime. And finally, when the submit form, uh, submit button is clicked, then we get another AJAX to inform the server side that something is going on. And when this is resolved or rejected, then this thing is resolved or rejected. So going back to everything, we can see that, in fact, a simple uh, multi-step process is, uh, seems to be quite a complex diagram. And if we take into account that after closing the transfer, uh, after closing the model window, we will need to reload all the, uh, all the table of all the transfers. We will need to uh, yep, reload this thing. So when this thing, is reject, uh, when this thing is resolved, then we need to fire another um, action here. So uh, the, the task of uh, core engine, so the task of uh, this layer is to provide a generic engine that could uh, solve those things, just for example. And uh, we can just take a look at one more diagram. There is a user that uh, clicks something in the interface, in the client, SPA browser, whatever you call it. Then there is a AJAX request, server does its work and responses. And then goes another step, another request, another response. So there is the third interaction, request, response. And finally, user might do something else after this. And um, the whole process um, is started, like the process in terms of backend, it started here and it's finished here. Like you can't start it from this point, you can't, fi you can't finish it in that point, like it will be just thrown out. And the interesting thing with this is that the flow operation, like flow and process is the same, the um, flow operation memory lifetime, uh, this is that part, so this is, uh, where the memory is allocated in the server to make this process like uh, alive until it's finished or rejected. And some people might say that this is violating the REST principles. And the answer is yes, it is violated. And the question now is why is that? Why, is, why are the REST principles violated in this case? Anybody has an idea? Sorry? Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's, very good. Um, that's a very good answer. REST is stateless, and as you can see in this slide, um, this is not stateless because uh, when you do the first step, you need to wait for the user interaction. So you can't proceed before the user does something. So you have to get another AJAX and then another AJAX. So this has to be divided into, into some, some steps. And if it's divided, then the server needs to remember what was done in the previous step. So um, either you, you, you look at this, you need to um, allocate some memory for that. And this is stateful and REST is stateless. So whenever you work on enterprise systems like this, you will never do uh, REST, uh, real REST. 
you will do some, we might call it quasi rest. Okay, so um, let's talk about the solutions we might use for this. I'd like to um, start with best practices you might use in an enterprise system, and the most important thing is that actually you got no uh, best practices here. And this is because uh, each project is different, each company is different, and hence you get different problems. Like a problem that you have been facing in three companies might not even appear in another company, so you just don't need to um, <laughs> try to solve it because this has uh, no sense. Um, but I would like to discuss just a few ideas um, that, um, that I found useful in both of the projects I've been working in. So, um, considering that there are a lot more back-end developers than front-end developers, uh, it may happen that there would be some stupid discussions and quarrels whether what is more important, front-end or back-end. So, uh, this is something that I've been facing like quite uh, many times. And um, yeah, especially when you get more backend developers than usually, the, there are more um, difficult problems on, on the backend side rather than in front. In front, it is just, you know, jQuery and colorful form. So um, this is yeah, what, what, the, what the reality is. And the problem is that the backend cannot force frontend to do certain things because if the backend is down, then the frontend is down as well. This is one thing. And another thing is that the frontend should be just, this is, an application, and the backend is also an application. This should be like um, parallel, they should be separate. It's not that one is more important than the other. And the um, um, approach to achieve this thing is API contracting. Uh, is there anyone who heard about such thing? Yes, just a few people. Uh, API contracting is defining the whole API in a document that will contain as much details about how the API works as possible. So it will contain the resources, it will contain the structures, what is allowed there, and how does the API react to some things. You can just put it into a document, uh, a text document. You store it in a repository, you make it available in the CI, and it can be used by many automates. So, um, when you run a job in a continuous integration server, you might use this meta definition of the API to do many fancy things that we will be talking in just a while. So, um, an example of a contract. Um, it's like you, we've got a songs URL that we, will, uh, we, that we could uh, fire a get, post, uh, requests, and there is a uh, slash song slash song ID and uh, it is available with get and uh, there are like artists and there is just a whole uh, tree of what um, of what resources are available and um, like you don't need to like go into the details of the syntax because there are different syntax but mainly I just want to show you how does all this look like. And you can describe the resources, like you can get a, uh, provide a description just to read it for, for yourself, and you can define that for, uh, for example, uh, for a get uh, request, there would be uh, query parameters that is called song title, and it has some restrictions that is required, its minimum length is three, type string, and so on. And uh, responses, that the server should respond with uh, HTTP status 200, and the body should be of content type application JSON, and an example is, and you've got a JSON object here. Uh, so this is more or less how this contract should, uh, could look like. And what you can do with this? Um, the most famous and most commonly used is documentation generators. So when you design, uh, when, when you work on a new task, you design the solution for a new task, you just update this API contract document and the first time when the continuous integration will be run, your documentation will be regenerated automatically. So this is how you can get always up-to-date documentation. Another uh, cool things you can do with this is generating mock data because um, Instead of providing strict JSON, you can uh, provide JSON schema, which defines the content, so you can get mocks generated all the time. Uh, you can make stub servers. Um, so, for example, you can just say that I want a node server, a temporary node server that would be working on port 8080, and will just respond to those uh, URLs with certain 
um, structures and a certain content, uh, HTTP statuses and content types with everything here. And you can also get test generators and runners. So, basing on this API definition, you can um, uh, generate the code to test or you can just run the tests. If you have a working Java API, you can run the tests to see whether this API that you're working with does conform to the standard. And if it doesn't, then you get the information, okay, you Java developers, you made a mistake. So this is how you can make it that front-end is not worse than, than back-end. And either way, when uh, there is, if you've got front-end and back-end tight coupling and you don't have the contract, when there is an error, you don't know uh, whose fault is that. And you need to find those things manually because even if you do have automatic tests, you need to find who made the mistake and you need to check the uh, contract conforming manually. And if you do use such things, then you just have it automatically because either the API test failed or the front-end test failed. And example of such contracting tool stacks is that this is the part you uh, might be familiar with, is yes, Swagger, API Blueprint or RAML, RESTful API Modeling Language. Um, how many of you have heard at about um, at least one of them? Okay, so it's uh, half of the room. Yeah, so this is something really, really cool. Most of people know that this is just used for online documentation for the API. This is good, but this is not all. There is a whole lot of more tools you might use this for. Okay, enough about contracts. Another thing is that, um, yeah, let's get back to the situation when uh, this um, backend is down and frontend developers have nothing to do. And uh, what I want to say is uh, a nice thing, especially in banking, is uh, introducing backendless development. So to make um, frontend uh, like independent on the backend, it doesn't require the backend to, to work uh, correctly. So how we can do this? Um, let's say that this is a uh, diagram of, of an application, of a front-end application we're, we're doing. Um, so um, the server API endpoint, this is the server part. Uh, the browser API is just what the JavaScript handling is built in the browser, like uh, XML, HTTP request, and set timeout, and all those things. Framework, so it's backbone, Angular, or whatever. Application core, application modules, and the uh, graphical user interface, so all the buttons, uh, events, handlers, and so on. So where you can mock the API. You, you might do it on f uh, framework level, so this would be uh, HTTP backend uh, service for Angular. It might be browser API. This is Synon.js library, or this might be just a mock server, uh, that is a real server, a Node.js or a Python or whatever server that really responds with the data. Um, which of them you want to use, this is completely up to you. Each solution has its uh, pros and cons. Um, don't want to uh, talk about this. Uh, this is a completely different um, thing. So um, when, you, when we um, enable the front end to uh, talk to mocks and this like basing on which of the level it is. Um, the benefits we get is that the parallel work of front-end and back-end teams is enabled. So, for example, um, when the business say that the core is going to be done by core developers, the permanent employees of the bank, the server site is going to be made by contractor company one, and the front-end is going to be made by contractor company two. And they do it simultaneously at the same time. So how can front-end be done when there is no back-end and when there is no core at all? This is the only solution you might do this. And this is a real situation that, that happens. Um, so parallel work of front-end and back-end teams is enabled. Another thing is that when core and back-end system fails, um, you don't give a shit because you, just, you can just uh, carry on with your work. And business circumstances. Imagine that uh, the business asks you to make a demo of a module, uh, of how would this look like. They want to make it like uh, look and feel, they want to click it, but they don't want to pay for implementing the backend stuff. With this, this is also possible, and this is also uh, something that happens in, in business. 
And uh, yeah, the, the solution is to make front-end possible to talk both to mocks and to the back-end. And I'm not going to say that it has only the benefits, because it does cost, and the initial cost of implementation of this is, well, let's say, quite big. And there is a small cost of maintaining it, because if you need to provide more modules, you need to spend some time on this. But what you gain is, in my opinion, a lot more, because you gain flexibility, um, so you may do whatever you want, like in different situations. You might, you gain the independence, so if anything breaks front and carries on, and you get faster development because you don't have to wait. And there is just one more thing. Um, when front-end works on mocks, and this is what I've been working in the last uh, project, like we've been designing the whole system without any backend at all for half a year, and let's say that we have done 95% of, of, uh, of all our work, and when the backend team started to write its API, there was only 5% of synchronizing the mock structures and everything was working fine with both uh, mocks and backend. Okay, so this is all about backendless development. Another thing is that uh, it's cool to replace JavaScript with other languages, like it's not trendy anymore to write JavaScript, right? What do you use? <laughs> JavaScript, okay, so this is the one. What more do you use? Uh, sorry? TypeScript. Coffee. Coffee script. something more? Java. Uh, uh, GWT, right? <laughs> okay, there is, there is one more. Okay, so, um, yeah, um, I've tried to use CoffeeScript uh, to, work, to write the whole system in this, and my experience is, well, this is subjective, but my experience with CoffeeScript is terrible, because um, I don't feel that it, it's worth introducing CoffeeScript because it provides, um, well, this is a very nice designed language, but it's um, it's completely different language, like uh, it has different syntax, uh, and um, first of all, when you introduce CoffeeScript into a project, then all backend developers need to learn another language, which works completely uh, different, like, for example, you've got the thin arrows and uh, double arrows, and uh, you need to learn JavaScript in order to understand CoffeeScript. So it has no sense. Like, you write the code faster, you read the code faster if you know CoffeeScript. So this is mainly not, not a good solution, at least in, uh, from my point of view. And the thing is that um, when we were introducing CoffeeScript to uh, backend people, we said that, Oh yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a modern solution, you're gonna like it. And we say that whenever we decide to go back to JavaScript, we are able to do this because CoffeeScript is transpiled into JavaScript. And uh, that time we believed in this. And uh, well, it, it is possible, but when we decided to try, uh, to try TypeScript, then we realized what code is generated from CoffeeScript when you need to pass contexts twice, for example. This is this is something I don't want to talk about, and um, yeah, we're not using CoffeeScript anymore, and the transition was really painful. So another solution you might use is ECMAScript 6, so the Harmony language, and TypeScript. And these are the languages I would like to compare, because they're uh, both interesting solutions. So, what are the features of ECMAScript 6? I know the font is really small and you probably can't see it because there's so many of those whole features. And uh, some of them are just arrows, classes, enhanced object literals, template strings, and so on. And most of it is really very cool, but it's only syntactic sugar. It's making JavaScript easier to write, easier to read, but this is only syntactic sugar. It doesn't change the way JavaScript will be executed. And if you're interested in all the list uh, of those features, they're available on, on this link. And how about TypeScript? TypeScript implements most of what ES6 does. Like, there are some probably differences, but they do um, introduce classes, modules, and arrows, and, and whatever. But what they do, and is the most important thing, is type checks. You can define the types and you can strictly check whether you do pass the correct types into a function as parameters. And this is checked in the compile time, not in runtime. So uh, if you make a mistake, 
you will find it before the code is even compiled and before this is executed anywhere. So this is a great feature that might be very, very useful in all applications. Um, not only big uh, bank, banking applications. Uh, for example, um, okay, so maybe I'll just carry on with this um, and uh, go back in a while. Um, TypeScript introduces type check. This is an ongoing process. It already um, is going to be supported in version 1.6 for uh, React, like JSX files would be um, the, the content of a template would be uh, type checked with the rest of your code. So if you make a typo in your template, you will get this in the compile time as well. So this is what is going to be introduced in uh, 1.6 for uh, React.js and uh, for other templates, it's just an ongoing process. And one more thing is that uh, TypeScript might be dumped into ECMAScript 6 and it's, uh, it is also an ongoing process. Uh, so if you write TypeScript, um, within some time you might use both of the advantages. And um, yeah, the uh, important thing about uh, TypeScript is that if you have an um, application written in either JavaScript or CoffeeScript and you uh, move it, migrate it into TypeScript, you will find the errors you are not aware of. For example, um, if you pass a deferred object instead of a promise, this is an error, right? Because if you should uh, put a promise just to listen to it, you should not put a deferred, which is changeable, right? And you don't see it because they have similar API. You might just not find it. But in TypeScript, you always type, what, you always define what is the type, and the compiler will, ch will just find this error. So during migration, you will find the errors you were not aware of and you did have in your application. So um, just... Uh, uh, fast example of what types, how does TypeScript look like. So we've got a function that has just two parameters that are just simply numbers and the function return number, it's uh, it just A plus B, the easiest example I thought of. So when we execute the function with a string instead of a number, we just get compile error, argument of type uh, string, this one is not assignable to parameter of type number. So this thing is not a number. This is an error we might, we might guess. So you can imagine how many um, problems you will solve even before the application is built. This is the first thing. Another thing is that uh, Java, uh, TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript. So if backend developers do know JavaScript syntax, they will know and understand the uh, syntax of TypeScript because this is just adding the, uh, the semicolon and the type, and this is, this is all to introduce type checks. And the rest might be done by some more experienced um, front-end developers, right? Yeah, so um, the advantage is, is that um, big code need type checks. Um, uh, for example, um, when you need to extend a low-level uh, class or object, if you do it in JavaScript, you will do this thing, and then you will have to go through all the modules to see what breaks, right? This is what, what you would do. And now you can just, um, or just run unit tests, but you need to find what has broke instead of what, uh, how to make the code like stable, right? And now you can just use the compile, uh, compile time type check. Another thing is that, yeah, you get less runtime errors and you will find a lot in, most of the bugs that are related to, to wrong types uh, in your existing code. The final thing I would like to talk about is automation. Like, I don't want to talk about uh, whether Grant is better or Gulp or Webpack or Browserify or whatever, This uh, everybody can use what, what he or she uh, prefers. But um, the thing that you might uh, um, face quite often is that you will need to have uh, single code base, one code base, that will be deployed for different instances that will have different features. Like one situa the situation I'm having right now is that we're writing uh, an application that will be deployed in over 100 of banking um, companies and they will have different modules, they will have different um, languages, they will have different whatever, yeah. And um, another thing is that you might have like an 
For one bank that does not work it with other banking companies, you might have private banking application and business banking application. And why should you uh, write another code base for this? This is just using the, this could be just the same engine, but deployed in different instances and using the different modules. So how can we um, achieve such thing? Uh, this might be done with uh, creating the instances and making the automation process understand what is defined in the in, um, instances. So for example, you might just define what is the name of an application instance. You might define a full name if you need it to display anywhere in your templates. You might find the uh, HTML title. You may just define the API, whether it's mock, and if it's mock, then you uh, run the whole automation process for building mocks and to make this application use the mocks. Or you can just tell what is the API um, URL. The, uh, the result of this is that you can write, like we're using grunt, we type uh, grunt build, and this will uh, by default use the mocks, or we can use grunt build minus minus API equals and the address. And this is all you do, and this is like fairly easy for both front-end and back-end developers, and you get everything automated. And the application works totally the same. If we need to make a business demonstration uh, for, for somebody, doesn't matter, and uh, we need to do it fast, we don't have the time to wait for the API to, like, to rise. We don't have the hour to wait for this, so we just put the marks, and that's all. And um, we can dynamize what modules should be used. We can dynamize what language packs uh, are going to be included here, what is, what is available, what is the default language, and what are the styles, like um, SAS, Stylus, or Less, or whatever you use, and whether you want to see some debug information in the JavaScript console. So the whole um, automation um, environment, Grand Gulp, or whatever you use, uh, could understand all this and use this. And this is something that you need to spend some time on because there are no solutions existing that do this thing, but the benefit you get from this is really great. Like, um, the Java-based Maven solution is, works exactly the same way, and this is what we've been trying to, um, um, to look at when we were designing this thing. And one more thing about the automation is that uh, you might uh, use Yeoman to keep the project structure concise. This is not about the generators you may find in the internet, for example, generator backbone, generator angular, and other things, um, because they, uh, many people say that they have tons of things that don't need, so it's faster for them to write their own boilerplate instead of using Yeoman, okay. Um, but the feature that many people are not aware that Yeoman allows you to create your own generators. And this is also something that is very useful. Um, the thing in, um, another thing that we tried to uh, copy from uh, Java and enterprise solutions is that you've got some things that are called archetypes in Maven that when you, um, this is, these are just skeletons. So when you just generate a Maven archetype, you get a skeleton for a RESTful API, for example, based on um, uh, JEE or on Spring. And why not having such thing uh, for, uh, for front-end, right? And um, for example, the, the thing that might be a problem here is that we have different modules done by different teams all over the, um, all over like Europe or even all over the world, and uh, they might do it in a slightly different way. Because, for example, in Angular, you might put just uh, module dot controller and just define the thing, and module dot filter, and nobody checks where do you put it. Right? You can put it just anywhere uh, as long as it's going to be included in the build process. It's going to get into the sources. But it's not nice if you need to find where the, f where the hell is this filter, uh, like which file is it, or you need to grab or find or search through all the code base. This is something really uh, frustrating. So you can just uh, provide a uh, Yeoman custom generator that will just say that I want this file structure, I want this folder to be created, this file with uh, certain names, 
and just to say that all contractors and all core developers should use this generator. Thanks to this, you get a um, concise um, shape of the application. You will get the same structure. And if you want to change it, you can just migrate it. And this is, this is something really useful. And by the way, um, like for example, if you're using uh, different, uh, app, um, different frameworks like Backbone, sometimes you need to, if you want to uh, make something that is really easy, you need to copy paste like many files, which takes a lot of time and is not really, um, it's, it's, it's not, it's not uh, something interesting. So this is also a solution for this problem. So um, this is um, all I prepared for today. So just to sum up, um, Working in enterprise uh, systems and environment, it is quite specific. <laughs> it is not something that, that you might be uh, used to. But the thing that I find uh, the, the most cool about it that is that it's really challenging because um, you will have many problems that you will never have to face um, in smaller applications. So you need to really think of what is the solution that will work and will not cost that much. So this is something really, really challenging, and it's, it's, it's something really cool. And it's, uh, in terms of a front end, it's still being explored because we've got an explosion of all JavaScript libraries and tools. So uh, it's our creativity to find the best way to combine them to get the, the best benefit. Okay, so um, that's all I have. Thank you very much. And just one more thing, if you want to get in touch or if you want to uh, like, um, or if you're interested in the things I, I, I talk about, you can follow me on Twitter and I hope you have some questions you would like to ask. Hello, I would like to ask you about uh, the, the thing you said about the sessions and uh, the state of the application. Uh, do you do you find do you, are you familiar with the session scopes and the uh, of the backend and uh, those uh, mechanism and uh, I am wondering I want I'm wondering uh, if you explored the idea to copy uh, them also to the front end so to have a session scope or view scoped wizard scoped and uh, other components in uh, I, for example angular uh, that can uh, contain a state just like uh, the backend uh, does. And then you can just uh, use REST, regular REST. Okay, so <clears throat> the answer for the second question is that even if you copy the information about the session or, or the process, like uh, the where are you in this process, if you copy it to the front end, this doesn't change the fact that backend still needs to be aware of it. Because if, if you have a multi-step multi, multi -step process, like first you need to define how much money and to whom you want to transfer, and you've got this information, so then you have to open uh, like um, a process, and it needs to be registered and allow, allowed by the core bank, and it will have a certain time until it's valid. So um, even if you, um, you, you need to get through all this let's say, all the layers to, to accomplish. So even if you uh, copy this information into front-end, it doesn't change the fact that back-end, the server side, needs to be aware of it because it needs to process it somehow because it has to go to the, co uh, to the core and it needs to check whether you are you. So it has to store this information somewhere. And regarding the first question, um, whether we um, use Angular scopes, um, well, the solution we are uh, aiming at is like we are still um, extending this engine of, of how those uh, promises and deferrals work. Um, uh, the approach we are, we are um, aiming at is uh, to make the engine process the the definition of the process. Like we define that the, we want to have a JSON that will just define that there is a step. Uh, step one and step two, and what are the behaviors of those steps? What are the possible next steps, previous steps, going forward, going back, and, and uh, such things? And um, 
this is just going to be included into the engine. So it would be like um, processed automatically. I don't know if, if it answers your question. Okay. More or less. <laughs> Any other questions? Mm, I felt that you've been uh, advertising, uh, advertising the TypeScript. And I have a question about the mm, IDE's uh, com compatibility with, with this language. Are there, you know, some plugins to IDEA or WebStorm, something like that, just to couple with the columns and type names? Mm -hmm. I know that there is a um, there is a, a support for a TypeScript uh, for uh, IntelliJ WebStorm, as far as I know. But unfortunately, I don't use this one because it is not allowed in my company. So um, yeah, this is this is the the cons <laughs> of working in, in in this enterprise environment. Uh, we are forced to use Eclipse, and there is I know there is no plugin for Eclipse. So um, yeah, I'm just using. Um, I, I do have this uh, JavaScript uh, syntax highlighting for uh, for JavaScript, and I can like understand it. At Eclipse uh, can like some sometimes it can even uh, like guess what is the type. Uh, of of a of a variable, but unfortunately, I I don't know <laughs> what what is the current state. But I think that um, it's uh, it should be available for most of these uh, IDs. Um, yeah, I guess. Uh, I al also has uh, ha has a question about TypeScript. Uh, but I'm interested in um, in error stack traces. I, is it possible to uh, have the original uh, line with uh, errors uh, uh, from TypeScript, not from uh, transpilot or compiled JavaScript? I'm interested. Uh, I'm interested uh, especially in Node.js. Do you have any experience in uh, uh, this area? Um, as far as I know. Um, you will just have the uh, when when I get an error, um, I just have the uh, copy of a code that uh, like displayed in the console, and it just shows the, the the place that you have. And as far as I know, can't check it right here, but I think that you should have the uh, source file and the line that has the line that fails. I guess it's it is there. This is this is. You mean source maps? Yeah, yeah but I. But I don't know whether you're not talking about different things because you asked about uh, checking w where is the source of the problem when doing compile time checks, right? And this is not about ah, you're talking, uh, you're asking about source maps. I'm talking about uh, runtime, so you have ah, TypeScript. Ah, runtime. Okay, you, so you so you the answer is what what okay. they said is source map. Source map. Okay, yes. So it's it's the same like you use in uh, CoffeeScript or in SAS stylus. It's it's the same, but for uh, compile time errors, you just get the line number and the file. All right. So time for. So. Uh, I wanted to thank you about criticizing CoffeeScript. It's, it, it, it refreshes <laughs> my, my mind. I uh, didn't want to offend anybody. <laughs> oh, you. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed that part. Um, how do you deal with performance issues? Uh, for example, in Angular applications, if you have many developers working uh, on, 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 the same, on the same stuff. One of the problems that you might face with Angular is that uh, by default, when you use um, ng-bind or ng-model, you get those um, two-way or one-way data binding by default. And this is something that uh, sometimes you don't want. And the problem is that it's uh, like this is the default behavior. And the thing that we do, for example, to solve this kind of problem is to write a directive that will not use uh, ng-bind, but it will use this uh, double semicolon um, notation that will just um, display the value once, and it doesn't listen to anything. So uh, 
This is a very good question you asked. Um, if, if we let like other people, the contractors who know Angular less, like it's, it's not the problem we are facing now, but it's a problem that we would probably face in, in one year or two years time, is uh, we don't want them to, we, we don't allow, we don't want to allow them to make this kind of mistakes to use this uh, binding. So we encapsulate reusable components to use uh, to use binding or not to use binding the way we want. So we just encapsulate everything to use no binding at all, for example. So we just tell them, use this component, and here you've got an example how to use it. This is just an example of, of how to deal with uh, problems. So it's encapsulating things. All right, any other questions? No questions. One question. Last question. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I really enjoyed it and um, I find it a little bit, um, I, I, it seemed a little bit contradicting yourself when you talk about um, the, the rest and uh, the fact that you had to somehow, um, uh, somehow introduce CoffeeScript to backend developers. So could you let a, a little, a, a elaborate a little bit more about, uh, about that? Um, can you like, um, say the, the question once again. I didn't understand it. Uh, actually, you mentioned that uh, you you had you found it hard to introduce CoffeeScript to, uh, because it was difficult uh, for backend developers to comprehend. Um, but at the same time, you're using REST. So you mentioned also that the the application, uh, the, the front end part and the backend backend part are separated. So why are the backend developers interested in in understanding what's what's going on behind the behind the scenes in front end? Okay, I will try to answer you with uh, with a slide. <coughs> so this is the answer. Um, working in such projects is budget driven development. So if you um, if there is a project that you need to do by a certain date by a deadline. Uh, some managers might decide to put just anybody to do this. It doesn't have to be front-end developers. Because front-end developers are busy on doing a project with a deadline already, and we've got back-end developers who don't have anything to do, so we'll put them. So this is an example that this code needs to be, like, it will never be, like, uh, wonderful and easy for everybody, but uh, this is why uh, you should um, make it as easy, as, as understandable as possible. This is one thing, and another thing is that um, our experience with um, with CoffeeScript is that um, well, CoffeeScript we just change our mind and we just don't like CoffeeScript. <laughs> but I can I can talk about this like sure. later on. I will just sure, give you some they examples. Also they also happen to to code in backend. Excuse me. They also happen to code uh, in backend. Um, as well. Did I? Uh, because you're a front end developer, and you mentioned that the back end developers sometimes are forced to, to code a little something bit in the front end. Yes. So it, yes, was it I did. Working reversely also? Yes. Okay, that's interesting. Yes. <laughs> I don't want to work in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's very good, like, yeah, w whatever you want, but it's uh, always good to understand what is going on in back end in order to uh, understand how to do the front end. Like, it's, it's always good to understand both parts. Even, e even if I'm not a back end expert, I'm really happy to understand how does it work. Because, for example, understanding uh, how to design REST contracts, this is something that you need to know how does back end work, more or less, uh, to do it correctly. Like, um, if, you, if you want to go higher in front-end, at some point you will have to learn a little bit of back-end anyway, so. Thank you very much, Tomasz. Thank you.